Hey there, it's Julie. And today I wanted to respond to Goji Man's video on Ravana. In today's video, I review one of the most triggering videos you would have watched in a while. Roll the titles. All right, so Goji Man obviously got very triggered by Ravana's statement that she had SIBO and this was one of the reasons that she left the vegan diet. And his belief is that veganism does not cause SIBO. So like she says here, she had SIBO that was causing her problems. It was nothing to do with the foods that she was eating. That SIBO is an issue with excess bacteria in your small intestine, which is true. And that is, it is unrelated to diet. He believes that you can treat SIBO even on a vegan diet and that, you know, usually it requires a course of antibiotics or some kind of antimicrobial to help get rid of that bacteria and then you can go on to eat your vegan diet. Now for the vast majority of people, this is something that can be resolved in a matter of weeks or months using antibiotics or natural antimicrobials. So today I wanna to talk about what causes SIBO so that you're aware of how that have developed and that is going to be a really important part of your treatment because if you just kill the bacteria, here's the bad news is that SIBO will come back. It is, um, unfortunately will come back. It's stubborn to get rid of and if you don't fix the underlying root cause, like why it happened, after you're on the antibiotic for 10 or 14 days, it will come back. If you take antimicrobials for 30 days or for six weeks and you don't get to the root cause of the problem, it will come back. So don't waste your time, don't waste your energy without having the whole comprehensive approach. So obviously you can't just treat it with antibiotics. You need to find the cause. And this is what Goji Man is kind of not really going into much. I don't know. I haven't watched all his videos, so maybe he does in other videos, but basically it sounds as though he thinks you get rid of the bacteria and then you can go on eating all these foods, these high fiber foods. Now, SIBO is, I think, a very complicated issue. It sounds like there's so much information about it and there's so many reasons we think that people get SIBO. For instance, sometimes it's low hydrochloric acid, sometimes it's uh, low gut motility, other times they think it's because the ileocecal valve is not holding things in. And this is the topic I'm actually going to discuss in more detail in a second. So there's all these possibilities offered to people. And I do believe that sometimes, for instance, maybe you get an infection and you get SIBO. That could be possible. But I think there's a very simple explanation to it that for some reason, we're just not looking at. I'm not quite sure why. So if you've seen my video entitled Vegans, Where Do You Ferment Your Fiber? This is very important for this topic. So if you have not seen it, go watch it, come right back. Just, you know, hit the watch later button on this and then just come back to it, okay? Very important to understand because the cecum in humans is not really, something that we use much. I mean, it's something that herbivores use in order to store bacteria to ferment fiber in their foods, but humans don't really use their cecum. There's a tiny bit of bacteria in it. It's kind of lost its function. That's kind of what scientists believe at this point. Carnivores have a very, very basic cecum that's not very well developed. And omnivores like dogs, have a cecum, but it as well is not um, very functional. Whereas in herbivores, uh, the hindgut fermenters, like a horse uh, and even like great apes, who are not herbivores, they're actually omnivores, but they have a hindgut fermentation system as well. Whereas cows are foregut fermenters, they ferment everything in their four stomachs. Hindgut fermenters, will ferment their fiber in their cecum. So a lot of great apes derive fatty acids from fiber fermentation in their cecum. Humans cannot do that. The only place we ferment fiber is really in our colons. And that's not very effective. We can only ferment a very small amount of fiber in our colons. And that fiber doesn't go to nourish us. It just really nourishes the bacteria in our colons. Okay, so why am I talking about this? 
because I think there's something that we're overlooking in SIBO. Now, there is a range of optimal amounts of fiber that humans can consume. Although vegans would like you to believe that you can consume large amounts of it. And so if you do eat over these amounts, you're going to get issues. You're going to get gas, you're going to get bloating, you can get constipation or diarrhea, etc. You're going to get problems. So we're not really supposed to eat too much fiber. People are usually focusing on how little fiber we're eating because we eat so much processed food. But I want to look at the issue of too much fiber here because let's just think of it logically as a concept, okay? Let's say in the colon, you're eating tons and tons of cellulose fiber, okay? Tons of it. That's the plant fiber that you cannot digest. It goes through your system undigested and it reaches your colon. This is your colon. Okay. And it goes in there and the bacteria have a party. Okay. They're like, what is this? There's so much food. Let's eat. Let's make more bacteria. Let's procreate. Yay. Bacteria party. Okay. This is going on in your colon and they're just going to bloom. And then that bacteria is going to have to go somewhere, right? It's going to have to go up through your valve. Like that, there's only two ways to go. It's like down or up. So if it's going to go up, it's going to go through that ileocecal valve through the cecum. And I would think go into your small intestine, right? Doesn't that make sense? Too much fiber in the colon has to go somewhere. And that ileocecal valve, it's like any other valve in your body, like your esophagus, between your stomach and your esophagus, that valve, if you have too much stomach acid, it's gonna go through, right? It's gonna leak through. So if you have too much bacteria in your colon, that's gonna go through, it's gonna come back up, okay? And this could be a possibility. Like, I don't see why this is not mentioned in SIBO protocol. And I think it's because we don't want to discourage people from eating fiber because, you know, the, the tendency is towards encouraging things that the majority of the population are not quite doing. However, there are people suggesting certain diets to deal with SIBO, right? So there's the low FODMAP diet, which from what I've heard from the Cedars Sinai Medical Center is that the low FODMAP diet is effective, but it also within a few months causes nutritional deficiency. So uh, I don't know how many of you know, but we recently published uh, with a colleague of mine, uh, a review article on diet and IBS. So the question is, what do we eat with IBS? Um, in, in that paper, we describe a number of techniques of eating, but also different food additives or food spices that, that can actually inhibit bacteria. But, but specifically, what we use is we use the low fermentation diet. The low fermentation diet, we sort of developed it in year 2000, 2001, and it basically restricts the number of foods that ferment. Um, now, it's not as restrictive as the low FODMAP diet. As you know, the low FODMAP diet is very popular these days. The couple of problems with the low FODMAP diet is that, and, and with any diet for the most part, is that it's hard to do. It's hard to do the low FODMAP because it's very restrictive. The other problems that have been encountered with the low FODMAP diet is that the low FODMAP diet is so restrictive that after three months you get nutritional deficiencies that are measurable. So they wanted to come up with a diet that was going to be adequate nutritionally, um, but also effective, right? And as a side note, let me just say that like, if vegans are recommending a FODMAP vegan diet, that is going to be even more restrictive. Like, can you just imagine how much faster people are going to develop nutritional deficiencies on a vegan FODMAP diet? Like, okay, that's just a little tangent, but Anyway, let's just continue. So the Cedar sinai Medical Center came up with the low fermentation diet. And this is kind of going along with my concept. And let me just read it to you here. So how the diet works. It says, before we get to specifics, there are concepts you need to understand. 
The type of food is very important that you eat, okay? It says here, oil can be left on the counter or in your cupboard. It does not need to be refrigerated. Ordinary bacteria cannot digest fats in isolation. So the oil does not spoil. If you put a tablespoon of sugar in that oil, it will spoil bacteria like sugar. But keep reading because it is not that simple since humans like and need sugar too. Not everything you eat is used by you. That's why you have stool. You take what you know how to get calories from and the rest goes out as waste. However, whenever you cannot di- whatever you cannot digest goes to the bacteria in the gut. Now, when they say the bacteria in the gut, they really mean the colon because most of the bacteria in our bodies is in our colon. There's not supposed to be a lot of bacteria in our small intestine, hence why SIBO is an issue, right? Okay, they will eat part of it. When they do, they produce gas. They also reproduce. Doesn't say that, I just added that, okay? Sugars are an important topic. Humans need sugar and bacteria use sugar. Some sugars are easier to digest than others for humans. Table sugar is easily used by humans, so we grab it well before bacteria can. However, there are other sugars that humans don't grab so easily and will spread further down the gut and be shared with the bacteria. So there's a table here. The easily digested sugars are sucrose and glucose. The more difficult are fructose and lactose. And then the other ones are sucralose, which is Splenda. So I don't know. Most people aren't eating Splenda, except for maybe unnatural vegan. (laughs) Sorbitol in sugar-free gum. Okay, I don't chew that. Xylitol, oh, lactulose, lacetol, many others. Okay. When bacteria get sugar, they are most active in producing gas and therefore symptoms. Another principle with sugars is the concept of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are long chains of sugars. Here too, some types humans can use, some not. Most plant carbohydrates are cellulose based and not digestible by humans. However, bacteria can digest these. They suggest taking these hard to digest sugars out of your diet and just eating sugars that are very digestible to humans and therefore kind of not giving the bacteria too much food and then it will die off, right? Makes sense. So this makes sense in in what I'm talking about here. If you're on a vegan diet, you're eating too much fiber, it's all going to your colon because the bacteria there are the only bacteria in in your body that can digest it. They digest it, they proliferate, go up through your your ileocecal valve, through your cecum and into your small intestine and boom, you got SIBO, right? I'm just surprised this is being overlooked as an option. Like we don't wanna tell people to eat less fiber, I guess, right? Because they're afraid of, I don't know what happens when you eat less fiber. However, even that's kind of questionable, but that's a whole other topic for another video. So Goji Man, telling Ravana that she should stay on a vegan diet for animal rights or whatever is wrong. It's wrong. She should be eating less fiber, less undigestible fiber and carbohydrates to heal her SIBO. And the human body doesn't really seem like it's equipped for that much fiber. I think Ravana is making the right choice. She's choosing more digestible foods, foods that are gonna nourish her body, high nutrient dense foods, um, because SIBO can cause nutrient deficiencies and Goji Man does mention that. And she's gonna kill off that bacteria and get her health back. Go Ravana, keep doing what you're doing. You're rocking it. Peace out. Peace out everyone.